If you haven't seen, Dave Kaufman went up to Africa and he filmed a ball python movie. Now we are going to analyse this movie and extract implications for captive care. All other things in this movie are not covered in this video. I am strictly looking at what applies to captive management. Nothing to do with the socio-economic and cultural references within this movie, although they are excellent and I recommend watching them. So the very first thing that we see is Dave out in Africa, in Ghana, with a local guide called Baturi. It's now early May and the ball pythons are still sitting on eggs. And so we ventured out with our guide Baturi Ali to find our first ball python in the wild. And hopefully, we might find one sitting on eggs. This is a great visual documentation of what they're actually doing out in the wild, and I think it's great to see this in video format. The first bull python they find is a female found by Baturi as he found her sitting right outside her burrow. Baturi found this female sitting right here just outside her burrow and I later learned just why she was doing that. Dave says he later finds out why so let's jump to that and we'll flicker back and forth over what's relevant. That very first ball python that we saw in Ghana probably wasn't out basking. She was probably out because her eggs in that hole were too hot. Now I know some people are posting critiques upon his methodology and how he's measuring the temperature of the eggs and whatnot. I'm not too concerned with it, I have to say. I don't really care personally. I think we've incubated enough ball pythons in captivity to kind of figure out what sort of temperature ranges work by now. Now Dave says that these eggs are definitely on the warmer side, so he thinks that the royal python is leaving the burrow to let the eggs cool down and not necessarily basking. I would like to provide an alternative viewpoint here. In a study written on how ball pythons are tracked in West Africa, the researchers interviewed local hunters on their tracking techniques. 15 hunters described locating pythons as being dependent upon the presence of indirect signs such as tracks. Now 13 of these hunters said that seeing a basking female near a burrow or signs that a snake had been basking there previously indicated the presence of eggs inside the burrow. This is the same observation Dave has made, but he interpreted this as her moving out to let the eggs cool down. I find that really interesting how the same observation can be interpreted so differently. Now in terms of which interpretation I think is more logical, hold on, this is my logic here. Firstly, I will suggest that the temperature range recorded on a sunny day in Togo, obviously no matter what you think about the methodology, are not mutually representative of what the temps of the eggs in that first burrow in Ghana might have been. I mean that was even an overcast day, so I don't think they are representative of each other. So here's how I think, a royal python is not warm blooded right, we know this, they are ectothermic, which means if she's not warm blooded and she's in fact cold blooded or ectothermic then her body will cool down and equalize with the temperature of her burrow if she wished to cool down. It's been demonstrated several times in this movie that the burrows of these pythons are actually several feet deep. All right so I just want to real quick show you this was the entrance of the burrow that's just how far down in the burrow they were. It could be argued that there's definitely enough room in there for the raw python to actually shuffle off the eggs to allow them to call if she wanted to without even leaving the burrow. But if we approach this from the initial interpretation, which is the eggs are too warm, my logical thought process is, well, why would the female move outside to sit in the sun on a seemingly baking day from that footage, only to return and then warm the eggs from her supercharged warm body from being out sat in the sun? Would this not warm the eggs and the surrounding burrow slightly rather than cool them? In my mind, this would exasperate the problem if they were indeed too warm. Does that make sense? I feel like adding heat to already warm eggs wouldn't make sense, unless warming up was her intention, and she was warming up and basking, thermoregulating, to bring that warmth back to use on the eggs. I would say that I am inclined to accept the interpretation from other people that she was indeed just basking. And to be fair, I do believe that that was Dave's original natural interpretation as well. He did say that she was basking in the original post, but then later edited it to say that she was just sat outside. I think he changed his mind. I would have absolutely have loved to see like a solar meter reading and surface temperature readings of this basking scenario, like he has in all his other wild expeditions using a solar meter and temp gun and whatnot. I feel like these measurements would have really helped interpret this further. Now Dave asked Baturi if he ever sees them up in the trees. 
and it is said that they are seen in the trees in the rainy season to avoid flooding. Again, this is later supported by those guarding him in Togo by responding in the same way. Now, I don't really contest that the pythons in these habitats are not spending the same proportion of their time climbing trees and then consuming the amounts of avian prey that they are in other areas. This logically makes sense. Most of this country and most of the ball pythons range in this entire area of Africa has been destroyed and converted into farmland and agriculture. Much of this habitat has substantially less trees. The abundance of resources are not the same in this habitat as they are elsewhere. And so to say that ball pythons are in the trees eating birds or they're in the ground most of their lives eating rodents, both of them are true. Nature doesn't work in black and white thinking. So when the research papers came out that showed that they were living in the trees and eating birds, you really can't read those research papers without the context of where those papers were written. The ball pythons that we have in our homes are descended from ball pythons that live in the sub-Saharan savanna. They live in burrows and they eat rodents. I really enjoyed seeing recognition of these papers within this movie and I completely agree they are not sat in a burrow or in the trees. It is not black and white. However, I do not agree that the pythons are different just because ours are descendant from those from Ghana, Togo and Benin. If you look at the ball pythons range, they exist in a myriad of different habitats. Their range is gigantic. I would suggest that they would not have had such a large range without a diverse and adaptable behavioural repertoire. Again, our original ancestors of these pythons collected from anthropogenically altered habitats because that's the easiest and most efficient for the hunters is not representative of the animal's full behavioural repertoire and as what has evolved into the animal. Personally, I would also not interpret observations of bull pythons during the day, the most inactive period within a bull python's 24 hours, in the dry season and breeding season, the most inactive period of the bull python's year, whilst they're sat on eggs. I would not interpret this as a holistic representation of how pythons in this area are living their lives. Just to add perspective, Luca Lucili, who is the author of the papers suggesting that rural pythons are semi-arboreal and are eating lots of avian prey in Nigeria, also radio tracked royal pythons in Nigeria for five years from 2000 to 2005. He found that most snakes you know, over 90% of climbing fixes in both sexes, climbed during the nocturnal hours, while they were motionless inside burrows during daylight time. Hence, the locations during daytime, you know, inactive inside burrows, cannot be used as a reliable indicator of habitat type use. If one were to search for Nigerian bull pythons during the day, during the breeding season, and then looked for them in burrows, then you may conclude that they spend all their time inactive in burrows because that is what you found. Which we know for certain in these Nigerian populations, that is certainly not the case. What I'm saying is that you find what you look for. We need to view these things holistically. I do recognise that Dave tried to go right down the middle in this matter, and I think that was the sensible decision for him to do from a YouTube perspective. It leaves a wider appeal for the movie by not deriding or denouncing one, one way of thinking or the other. Dave also says that African soft furs are absent in West Africa and they're actually South African lab rats and are not the main component of the bull python's diet in these habitats. African soft furs are lab rats from South Africa. They do not exist as we know them here in the wilds of Africa. And I'm so very glad that he has brought this up and that they are not exclusively out there eating African soft furs like some people uh, think at least. However, just to be fair here, in one study it cites information from the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources, the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi in Ghana, and they list the rodent pests known to occur in Ghanaian farmland, and that also includes African soft furs. So this would suggest that African soft furs are present in West Africa or at least in Ghana at least. So it is entirely plausible that they do make up a proportion of the ball python's diet in these habitats shown in this movie, just they aren't exclusively the main thing they eat. Again, I want to point out that there are no stomach flush studies within this area that they've showed in Ghana or whatnot. The only stomach flush studies we have are the ones from the Nigerian populations. So we cannot know for certain what these snakes are eating. 
because it's pretty much data deficient. Although, however, in captivity, I would argue that it's largely irrelevant. Offer them variety from young, and if you have variety available to you, offer what you think they'll take. I mean, it's not like our farm-raised lab rats are actually like comparable nutritionally profile-wise to what the wild counterparts of rodents are anyway. Our captive farmed lab rats are incredibly fatty by comparison. Dave finds a python out on the move when he goes out and looks for them during dusk period. Now, this is actually their main activity phase, and that's why he finds one on the move. I have asked every hunter, every person that we have gone out in the field with, from Ghana to Togo to Benin, I have asked them what ball pythons are doing at night, and I get the same answer across all three countries. They are active for a couple of hours in the morning, then they go into their burrows all day long, and then at evening time, like now, they start coming out of their burrows only for a couple of hours, then return back to their burrows at night. What's really interesting is how well these actually line up with what a German paper found in captive raw pythons. This paper investigated their behaviour during different activity phases in racks and then vivariums. What this paper did was break up the day between three activity phases, 4pm to 11pm, 11pm and 1 minute, to 7am and 7am to 3.59pm. So effectively morning and dawn, day and then dusk to night. The royals were filmed via cameras. Now what this study did was define different behaviours. So on the move was defined as crawling forward. And then what they found was crawling forward happened significantly more in the vivariums. You mean, no surprise there, they don't have the room to do this in the racks. But it peaks in this dusk period that is their main activity phase. And this is what Dav found the royal doing. He was out and about locomoting. Python, Python, Python! They found a peak in other behaviours during this main activity period also, namely climbing, digging, basking and bathing. The least active period of time coincides with the movie at 7am to 4pm, the main part of the day when they're sat in their burrows. I would suggest that because this movie has supported the results within this study and validates these activity patterns, it also adds credence to the other observations from within the same study, which is the negative stress behaviours that were filmed in the racks. The stress behaviour pushing the mouth against the barrier happened only in the racks and peaked in their main activity phase. Logically, this is because when they actually want to come out and emerge, they can't and that they want out. Now don't get me wrong, racks are excellent for providing security during the inactive periods but they are not letting them express the rest of the behaviours that they want to. Personally, I would opt for hides within a vivarium that would achieve the same effect. Now, I do recognise that racks are suitable for temporary situations like housing hatchlings, quarantine, and in shops that will later sell those animals into a permanent setup more suitable. I mean, even I have hatchling king snakes in rubs. Sometimes that is just the logistics. And again, it's temporary. So the next time you see that a raptor shop actually uses racks, but then goes to sell you a nice suitable 4x2x2 with overhead lighting for the ball python that you want to buy from them, it's not because they're trying to sell you all these extra things that you don't need to try and mug you off. It's because that's what's optimal for the animal, and it allows it to express its natural behaviour patterns, just like we see in the studies and now this movie. It's just that the shop is a temporary holding for an animal that's supposed to be sold onto a perfectly good pet home for the next 40 odd years of its life. Do you want to see if your royal would do something, then offer it the choice and see what it does. Provide options everywhere that gives the royal the agency to spend its day as it wishes. Basically, if you view everything as choices and giving options, then none of this bickering about climbing a birds even matters. What is clear is that the behaviours that they have cannot be fully expressed in a rack or in any way that limits them from doing so. I just I do want to say that I think we should congratulate Dave on going out to Africa and filming these observations. I'm really glad he went out and filmed the observations that he did, even if I don't fully agree with some of his interpretations of those observations. One thing I do want to say is I think people need to give him some slack. Like, there are people making memes out of him left, right and centre. And while some of them are actually harmless and actually quite funny and creative... Some of them are absolutely ruthless and like you're just attacking him personally, like just calm down. Like you may be frustrated with some of his interpretations of observations, but at the end of the day, those observations are there 
for you to interpret yourself and then offer an alternative interpretation of those observations like I am doing now. I would recommend anyone watching to go down the rabbit hole and read all these rule Python studies and see how things line up just like I have. Or you could subscribe and just let me do it all for you. And if you have not seen Dave Coffin's movie, then you can find it here and you can go and watch that. It's got some good bits in it and I would recommend watching it.